Good morning. I suppose that when you saw this title, Super Conquerors, there flashed through your mind a vision of someone like Superman. I have to tell you this morning something that you probably don't know, and that is that Superman and I are contemporaries. <laughs> yes, the fact of the matter is that we both arrived on planet Earth within a few years of each other. Uh, I arrived in 1934, and I think he came in 1938. Uh, <clears throat> I know that I've, um, after all these years, I, I look younger and fitter than he does. But uh, there he's been around all that time, and I can remember reading about Superman and the Superman comics in the 1940s, when I was growing up as a young boy, I should have kept them. They would have been worth a lot of money these days. But uh, Superman has been around for a long time, but it's not that kind of superhero that I'm going to talk about. If we were to show it on the screen, it would be that picture of Jesus on the cross that Robert has just shown us, which is a picture of the true superhero, the true super conqueror, because that death was followed, well, on our behalf, was followed by his resurrection. And it's because of what he has done for us that we can make claim, each one of us, to be a super conqueror according to the passage that has just been read to us. And it's about that that we're going to be thinking together this morning. As we've uh, read this passage, Romans 8, 35 to 39, it brings us to the culminating um, section of this wonderful, wonderful chapter, Romans chapter 8. Um, and we have spent quite a lot of time in Romans chapter 8 precisely because it is so wonderful. Romans chapter 8 represents the very apex of gospel blessing. And these verses that we've read together this morning form the climax of that climactic chapter. So they're very, very wonderful words. And in order to get us into... Um, our frame of thinking this morning, uh, let me remind you that beginning from verse 31, Paul asks a series of four questions which are critical for the Christian life. We've already dealt with the first three questions. Today, we're looking at the fourth of those questions. And let me summarize those questions like this. In verse 31, the question is, who can... Who, is, who can be against us? And that, of course, raised the possibility of opposition. And that was followed by the question, who shall bring any charge against God's elect? Raising the question, the possibility of accusation. And then follows, who is to condemn? The possibility of condemnation. And the question that we shall be looking at today is who shall separate us from the love of Christ? And that is, raises the possibility of separation. Is such a separation from the love of Christ possible? Is it likely? Can it occur? And these four steps really trace the common strategy of the devil and his allies in attacking the people of God. There you have them. Accusation, uh, opposition, accusation, leading to condemnation and resulting in separation from God and from his love. That's what the devil's all about. That's what he's trying to do. And in response to each of this, Paul shows that God has made a full and perfect provision for us 
in the Lord Jesus Christ and all that he's done for us so that nothing and no one can ever effectively oppose, accuse, condemn, or come between us and God in such a way to separate us from his love. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? This is the climax, then, of Paul's four questions. And it receives the longest response. And it really comes as like a great big trumpet blast of victory. Paul doesn't end this chapter just with uh, some kind of, what shall I say, bare doctrinal admonition. He doesn't end it in just some plain prose. He really launches into this wonderful rhapsody where he dwells upon the sweetness of the love of God and Jesus Christ for each one of us and his children. And the way that he does so is actually quite breathtaking and mind-boggling. So Paul's question in verse 35 is, Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Is there anything that can drive a wedge between us and Jesus? And Paul's answer is that Christ's love is invincible. That security in his love is the anchor of our assurance forever. And I suppose as Christian people, we all know that in one way or another. We, I mean, it's become a quite an article of faith for us ever since we were in Sunday school. And there we learned to sing, didn't we? That Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. And uh, it's a given. It's something that has been factored into our thinking. It's an article of faith. It's a presupposition. But the barest glance at the passage before us this morning will demonstrate that Paul is not content with the love of Christ as some kind of theory. He wants us to taste it. He wants us to revel in it. He wants us to to experience it. And so he goes into this wonderful, wonderful rhapsody about the love of Christ. And so this morning I want to explore the passage with you in order to get some sense of Paul's delight into our hearts, that we might delight in the love of God and the love of Christ in the same way that that Paul did. And so we're going to meditate on four dimensions of the love of Christ in this passage. And the first thing that I want us to think about this morning is the realism of Christ's love. Now we don't usually associate love with down-to-earth level-headedness, do we? Aided by all kinds of media, we have this kind of uh, uh, romantic idea that love makes people a little bit crazy. And uh, when people fall in love, they get a bit goofy. And there's some truth in that. I remember when I fell in love so many years ago. Uh, I, I must have been going around looking a bit goofy because my mum said to me, what's up with you these days? And she knew that something was going on. Uh, but we've got to go beyond that idea when it comes to understanding the Bible teaching about the love of Christ for his people. Knowing his love and life is not something about escaping reality into something sentimental. That's not not what knowing the love of Christ is is all about. The love of Christ is real world love. And that's the first thing that I want us to think about, the realism of it, the realism of Christ's love. Who can separate us from the love of Christ? And Paul goes on to say, and these are very real things. He said, what can separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation? You see, it's down to earth, very down to earth, isn't it? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine 
or nakedness, or danger, or sword. As it is written, for your sake we face death all day long. We are regarded as sheep to be slaughtered. No, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. Now that is real down-to-earth stuff, isn't it? Just look at the list of difficulties for a moment. The realism of Christ's love is highlighted by this list. Tribulation comes first. And the Greek word for that is thlipsis. It carries the idea of a pressure like grapes being squeezed in a wine press. It's the crushing weight of difficult days bearing down on your shoulders. And to match pressure from without, this distress comes next. And that's pressure from within. You know the kind of pressure that you can feel when you're under all sorts of problems and difficulties, whether at home or in the workplace. Pressure from without and pressure for, from within. Uh, it's the psychological burden of a toilsome life. And then there's persecution. Suffering caused by others because of our faith in the, the Lord Jesus Christ. And then there's a starvation of famine and the exposure of nakedness and the threat of danger and the looming possibility of martyrdom by the sword. All of these things Paul is listing in the context of the love of Christ. And the things that cannot separate us from the love of Christ. It's really down-to-earth love. It's the kind of love that we need so much in the world in which we are living. And Paul draws on Psalm 44 verse 11 to remind us just how brutal that life can be. He likens the people of God to the flock being a flock of sheep being led to the slaughter. And he reads and quotes Psalm 44, verse 11, as it is written, for your sake, we are being killed all the day long. We are regarded as sheep to be slaughtered. And you know, the psalm likens the world to one vast slaughterhouse. What a prospect. It's not pretty, is it? It doesn't make pretty reading, but it does match the facts because God's people do suffer. And so often God's people can't make sense of it, can they? Unless they're able to lift their eyes above it and see the one who is above God in control. But not just the one who is above but the one who is with us in it all. Our Lord Jesus Christ, who is our shepherd and our carer, the one who walks the path beside us. And so Paul is not just papering over the cracks of our lives. He's not running away from the ugly, open wounds that so often can fester in our hearts. He's facing it head on, isn't he? External pressure, internal pressure, economic mis uh, um, um, misfortune, misadventure, and a sickness, a natural disaster, a world of tears and sickness and loss and sorrow and death. And he's in such a world, does the love of Christ crumble into nothingness? No, Paul says in verse 37. Not only do we not forfeit the love of Christ, but in fact, in all of these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. And I want you to look at that language carefully for a moment with me. More than conquerors is three words in English, but it's only one single word in Greek. It's a compound Greek word called hypernikomen, hyperconquerors. Super conquerors. That's what Paul says. Super abounding conquerors. 
We don't merely sneak out a victory, squeak out a victory, snatching at the last moment the jaws of defeat as if the love of Christ was some kind of last minute penalty goal scored in the golden time at the end of a game. It's that you've just run won by the skin of your teeth. No, it's an abundant victory. It's a super victory. If you're the object of the savoring love of Jesus Christ, you, you win with an absolute and complete victory. It's not even close. That's what he's saying. It's not even close. But look at verse 37 and notice the context of this victory. Let's be very clear about what Paul is really saying. It's not that the love of Christ rescues us from every trial. He's not saying the love of Christ keeps us out of famine and peril and sword and opposition and all the rest of the things that are stress and, and so on. He's not saying the love of Christ lifts us out of those things. He's saying in all of these things, we are more than conquerors. Look exactly at what he says in all these uh, here. There's something else too, uh, isn't there? The actual question that Paul asked in verse 35 is, who shall separate us? But then you notice he doesn't go on to mention people at all. He goes on to mention things. Nakedness, peril, or sword, distress and opposition and all the rest of them. Who shall separate? And then he gives a list of things. The word who suggests that behind these things there is some person or persons operating. And we know that to be the truth, don't we? We know that Satan loves to use these things and each, each sorrow and each suffering to bring us to despair and defeat. But verse 37 is teaching us that while our trials and struggles and losses may be the battleground, the love of Christ secures our victory, not just over the things that affect us, but a victory over the one who is behind those things and using those things to try and bring us to despair and to distrust and to hopelessness and to thinking that we are being separated from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. And Paul says that's not to be. We are, on the other hand, we are super conquerors through the one who loved us and the one who holds us and keeps us and will not ever let us go. And so you see, the promise here in these verses is that we will not always feel happy and carefree, no matter what our circumstances. That's a mistaken idea that some people are given even when they come to Christ. You come and trust in Christ and everything will be all right and you'll be happy ever after sort of a process. That's not true. What Christ promises his disciples is a life of discipleship, which involves taking up the cross to follow him. It's an invitation to that kind of life where these things will occur and where they must occur as a part of our pathway of discipleship. But the important thing is that Christ's promise of his presence with us and of his love surrounding us uh, and of him taking us and using us and making us super conquerors and all of these things makes the life of discipleship so much, so infinitely much more worthwhile than the sort of laissez-faire life of living without Christ in a world that knows him not, that is lost without him. So the love of Christ is real. It's a realistic love. There's a realism about it. 
It meets us where we are, surrounds us in all our circumstances, upholds us in all our difficulties. It's real, down-to-earth love, just as Jesus was real, down-to-earth God. Now, that's the first thing. The second thing is the experience of Christ's love. Paul knows firsthand what he's talking about. These are not theoretical possibilities that he's offering, but what we see here, and this is what makes it really telling, really compelling, really exciting, is that what Paul is giving us here is his own personal testimony. You get a sense of that when you see in verse 38, he says, I am sure, I am sure. Since verse 31, he's only been talking using the first person plural, have you noticed? He's been talking about we and us, who can be against us, who can bring any accusation against us, and so on. He, well, he's talking there about all Christians. Christians, that is, uh, things that he's saying is true of all of us. But now, all of a sudden, he interrupts that pattern and switches from the first person plural, we, to the, the, the uh, first person singular, we. He says, I am sure, I myself am sure, verse 38. And the verb that he uses here means that he's personally absolutely persuaded and convinced of the truth of what he's saying. He's speaking about the depths of his own conviction, shaped by his own personal experience. Nothing theoretical about this. You get this, a sense of you get a sense of that in, in some other passages, like Second Corinthians chapter eleven, beginning at verse twenty-four, where Paul's giving a dramatic account of his own sufferings for the sake of the gospel. He says, five times I received at the hands of the Jews forty lashes, less one, thirty-nine lashes." The law stopped short. Forty lashes was sufficient to kill a man, it was reckoned. And so your maximum allowed was 39. And he got that, what does he say, um, th five times. Five times he went through that tremendous, terrible, terrible experience. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned. Three times I was shipwrecked. A night and a day I was adrift at sea on frequent journeys to da in danger from rivers, danger from robbers, danger from my own people, danger from Gentiles, danger in the city, danger in the wilderness, danger at sea, danger from false brothers, in toil and hardship through many a sleepless night, in hunger and thirst, often without food, in cold and exposure, and apart from other things, there is the daily pressure on me of my anxiety for the churches. And in chapter 12, verse 10, he adds, For the sake of Christ, then, I am content with weaknesses, insults, hardships, persecutions, and calamities. For when I am weak, then I am strong. And can you see, even just from my rapid reading of those passages, I think that all the terms from Romans 8 verse 35 uh, describe the normal, uh, that describe, um, it says describes the no normal Christian life, are there in his own ministry, except for the sword. But that was going to come shortly not long after this, a few years perhaps, when he would be martyred for the sake of Christ in the city of Rome itself. But the point is clear enough, isn't it? When he tells the Romans, when he tells us in this epistle that the love of Christ can't be defeated, when he tells us that we are secure and safe in the grip of the love of Christ, no matter what hardships come our way, he himself is a walking, talking demonstration of that fact. And that brings great assurance to me. 
I'm sure it must do to you to think about here is a man who's not giving us theory, but he's giving us something that is truly vivid and truly vital, and it's reflected in his own experience. And I am sure I say this, that none of us have the experiences that we have been through in suffering wherever or whatever it might have been can compare to what Paul himself went through for the sake of Christ. And he's the one who's telling us these great, this great reassuring truth that whatever the pressure on us might be, whatever the circumstances of our life might be, and whatever the, the struggles that encompass us might be, Nothing can separate us from the love of Christ. And in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. Which brings us, thirdly, to the source of Christ's love. We've looked at its realism. We've looked at the experience of Christ's love. And thirdly, there is the source of Christ's love here in this passage. And the love of Christ flows from a particular source. If you look at verse 33, he says, No, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. And it's that last phrase that I want you to focus on with me. In verse 35 he said, Nothing can separate us from the love of Christ. And again, in verse 39, he's going to say, nothing at all creation can separate us from the love of God in Christ our Lord. And in both those cases, it's very clear, isn't it? The love of God, the love of Christ, is a fixed and stable and everlasting reality. So isn't it interesting here that in verse 37, Paul suddenly uses the past tense when he speaks about the love of Christ. He knows that there was a specific climactic moment in history when the love of Christ was poured out for us in a unique way. The one who loved us is pointing to some specific time in history, an action where Christ demonstrated his love to us. You see, the love of Christ is not some momentary surge of emotion. It's not merely a feeling. It's more than a feeling. He, he has loved us through all the different circumstances of our lives, but that ongoing love has an origin. It has a place where it was demonstrated And it's out of that great demonstration of his love that we have this realization and experience of his love that goes on and on. He has loved us, and that love was shown to us at Calvary. He loved us. He loved us under the Roman lash. He loved us as the nails were driven into his hands and feet. He loved us though everyone else around him had deserted him and abandoned him. He loved us under the wrath and curse of God. He loved us as he bore our sins as he died upon the cross. He loved us down into the grave and that love secured our pardon and our peace. Reflect upon that as you pass through the trials and difficulties of life, the circumstances that trouble you perhaps even today as you sit here. He loved you. He loves you and that love that he loves you with now was sealed forever, 
with the love that he poured out upon us as he died on our place, in our place on the cross at Calvary. The reason that we now are safe in the love of Christ right now is because of the love of Christ for us in that great crisis of the cross. When Paul describes how no trial or suffering or pain can break the grip of Christ's love on his people, he's confident in it. He says, I'm sure about it. Not only because he's experienced it for himself, although he has, but ultimately because he understands the love of Christ is a crucified love. It goes to such length to secure our deliverance, it flows to us from Calvary. It's rooted in the cross. I want to tell you a moment about the First World War. It was a great victory for the Allies. Britain, and France, Italy, and towards the end of the war, the United States of America it was waged, as you probably know, from 1914 to 1918, but it came at such a terrible cost. And I'm not sure how many of you know, but New Zealand was the nation that suffered most of all nations in the world, even though the war was far off in Europe. And you can go around the different villages and towns of New Zealand and see the cenotaph in those places where the dead are, are mourned. You see, New Zealand had a young population of just over one million people. And of those, 100,000, 10%, saw active service overseas with 18,500 dying and 42,000 being wounded. So 10% of New Zealand's total population fought in the war and 60% of those Kiwi soldiers became casualties who were killed or wounded. And that was followed by another 18,000 New Zealanders who were killed by the Spanish flu, which was brought back by the returning soldiers as they came back to the country. And New Zealand actually, even though uh, we were fighting a war in far off Europe, uh, fighting on behalf of Britain, who was, who, who was the motherland, New Zealand suffered more casualties per head of population than any country. And uh, I often wondered as I grew up during the time of the Second World War, why so many of my parents' friends were unmarried women. It was because they never had an opportunity to marry. So many young men had died in the war. So it was a victory. Yes, they conquered it, but it was a terrible, tragic cost. But you see, in the spiritual conflict that rages over our souls, we are more than conquerors. And to be sure, our victory comes at a terrible price. But it's not a price that we ever pay. The one who loved us has paid for that victory, and he's paid for it completely. He's paid for it in full. Nothing will separate us from the love of God and Jesus Christ our Lord because Jesus Christ our Lord was separated from the love of God in our stead. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? He was given up to the wrath and curse of God for us that we might never forfeit the love of, and grace of God in him. And so we have the source of of the love of Christ is found in the cross. Because of that, you and I are more than conquerors. 
So we've looked at the realism of the love of Christ and the experience of the love of Christ and the source of the love of Christ. Finally, let me say a word about the extent of the love of Christ. Is there any depth or pain of pain or grief or loss into which you can descend beyond the reach of his love? Can your trials become so intense <coughs> that the love of Christ is no longer a match for them? Well, look at verses 38 and 39. For I am sure that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. And Paul structures his message, as you can see here, around peers of opposites. He piles up these contrasts to make the point that from pole to pole, from one extreme to another, from horizon to horizon, the love of Christ holds us fast. And uh, whichever way we look at it, the love of Christ is sufficient to save and to secure. That's the message. This natural existence, with a death, with all the fear that it holds, or life, with all its troubles, this supernatural existence, whether angels or rulers or powers, probably a reference there to demonic forces, this time, whether things present or to come, this space, whether height or depth. In fact, Paul says there is nothing that is more powerful than God, nothing in all creation that is mightier than the grip of the love of Christ. Now that means that we can say, as we shall soon sing, in Christ alone my hope is found. He is my light, my strength, my song. And then it goes on to speak what heights of love and so on, and it speaks about Jesus Christ as a no power of hell, no scheme of man can ever pluck me from his hand till he returns and calls me home. Here in the power of Christ, I'll stand. So you are secure. I'd hope you see it. You're utterly safe in the love of King Jesus. And that assurance, your assurance, is not to be found in your strength, your goodness, your love, no, 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 none of those things. It's not even to be found in your faith in Jesus. It's founded ultimately on the strength of the love of Jesus for you. And there's no force in creation that is mightier than that. Let's join in singing our closing hymn.